Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Come on, lift your hands and say, Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Death could not hold you. You are, you are the risen King, and you're seated, seated in majesty. And so, Father, we give you the highest praise, which is hallelujah. We give you glory this morning for sending your Son to die for us on the cross. And God, we come, we've gathered, we've come together to celebrate your resurrection. We've come to magnify your name and to glorify you and to honor you and to be in all of your presence. We ask God for your anointing, the kind of anointing that breaks the yoke of the enemy, the kind of anointing that changes lives. In the name of Jesus, we ask God that you would word our mouth, give us clarity of thought and clarity of speech. In the name of Jesus, bind the hand of the enemy. Satan, the Lord rebuke you now. The blood of Jesus is against you. And we thank you even now for what you're going to do in this place. Thank you for the word that will come forth with power and with clarity. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Thank God. Amen. And come on, let's give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. Oh, you can do better than that. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Oh, give him praise this day. Hallelujah. We honor God and we bless his holy name. Everyone standing to your feet as we go to this morning's scripture. St. John 15, we'll just, for the sake of time, we'll read the three verses there in St. John 15, we'll read 12, 13, and 14, St. John 15, 12, 13, through 14, we'll read those there, and those of you who did not bring your Bibles, we have it in your program. Uh, St. John, the 15th chapter, and the 12th, 13th, and the 14th verse. I know you are there by the words of amen. Let's read there together. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I just want you to tell somebody, look at them in the eye and say, neighbor, he did it just for you. Oh, that's right. To find somebody else and look at him again and say, neighbor, I just came to tell you this morning that Jesus did it just for you. Now, if you believe that, clap your hands and praise our God. He did it just for you. You may have your seats in the presence of our God. We celebrate today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we celebrated the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Friday, we celebrated the death and the burial. But the heart of the gospel is not about the triumphal entry. Neither is it solely about the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. But the heart of the gospel is about the resurrection. Somebody shout resurrection. 
For if he hadn't rose, we would still be lost and it would make all that Jesus came to do null and void. The miracles of Jesus are great. The power he displayed while on earth were magnificent or was magnificent. But nothing compared to the death, burial, and resurrection. If he hadn't gotten up, my preaching would be in vain. If he hadn't got up, our singing would be in vain. If, if he hadn't got up, all that we do would simply be in vain. It really wouldn't be a need to come to church on Sunday if Jesus hadn't gotten up. It wouldn't be a need for us to gather ourselves together on Thursdays and Tuesdays and special revivals and doing all of these kind of things, reading our Bible, fasting and praying if he hadn't gotten up. Oh, but because he got up, all that we do is not in vain. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, Jesus already told them that he was going to get up. St. Matthew 12, 40. For as Jonas, this is Jesus saying, was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And further in Matthew 16, 21, the Bible says from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again on the third day. So take place uh, when we look at this, Jesus prophesied and foretold them of the things that were going to take place about his death, burial, and his resurrection. However, brothers and sisters, Jesus uh, didn't do it for himself. Uh, Jesus uh, did not come down for himself. Uh, Jesus did not come down through 40 and 2 generations uh, to suffer all these things uh, just uh, for himself. Uh, but I came to preach to you this morning that he did it uh, just for me. He did it just for you. He, he did it uh, for us and uh, brothers and sisters he suffered for you he 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 endured the agony and the shame for you and for me he endured the pain of the cross he endured the agony of the cross he endured the whips and the nails in his hands for you and for me that's why I serve him because when I realize the greatness of his sacrifice when I realize the greatness of his love toward me I understand I owe God anybody in here realize you owe God hey glory to God just tell somebody I owe him I, I owe him I, I I owe him he's been too good to me he he's done too much for me and I owe God Paul says it in Romans 8 12 uh, therefore brethren we are debtors he realizes that all Christ had done for him he owes God and he will do his will because he has done so much for him and so brothers and sisters I stand here today because I am a debtor I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because I am a debtor I do all that I do not because I'm trying to be seen not because I'm trying to impress you oh but brothers and sisters I do what I do because I owe God Oh, bless his name. I am in debt to God. Now, the reality of the situation is uh, you will never be able to pay off your debt because the debt is too great. Uh, but brothers and sisters, uh, the beautiful thing about being saved is uh, I am in process. Uh, I am working toward uh, my debt payment. Uh, I can't pay it all off, uh, oh, but the little that I do, uh, uh, my praise gives God the glory. Uh, all that I worship, all of my glow, all the things that I do, my tithe, my giving, uh, my coming to church, uh, it is not because uh, I am so great. I'm 
sounds so fantastical, but I owe God. And if you are in this house today and you realize that you owe God and that you know you can't pay for it, but you can give him something. You can open up your mouth. You can give him praise. You can lift your hands. You can not be stubborn with your praise. I don't have much to give, but all that I give, I give it unto thee. So do I have about 10 folk, only about 10, that just want to make a down payment on your debt? If you are here this morning and you want to make a down payment on your debt, I just want about 10 just to give God some un unrestricted praise right up through here. Yeah. Don't look at us like we crazy. We owe God. Oh, you may not understand my praise, but you don't understand how much he's done for me. Oh, he's done so much for me. How about Shatta? He's done so much that if we took time, some of y'all done been through a whole lot of stuff. And if we took the time just to talk about all the stuff we done been through. We would be here all night. We would be here all day. I mean, just all night. And you would still would have some left over. But we owe God. We, we owe him. Well, Jesus says in our text, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I loved you. Jesus says that we ought to love one another as he has loved us. These are strong words coming from Jesus as he is talking to his disciples before his departure. He wants them to love one another, be concerned about one another, look out for one another. One of the reasons I believe, and this is just my surmising of the text, uh, is that uh, uh, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that uh, he was going to die and his disciples' lives were also going to be at stake because of their following Jesus. So in the 15th verse, he emphasizes that they should love one another. But he doesn't just say love one another, but he says love one another as I have loved you. Jesus goes on to describe the measure of love. He says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Jesus described the measure and quality of his love for them to use as a pattern for the way they should love each other. His love is complete and of surpassing greatness, laying down his life. Let's really examine this, that he loved us so much that he laid down his life. Somebody say, he laid down his life. That's, that's really important to note, and that's really important to understand, that Jesus laid down his life. Jesus says in 10, 18 of John, he says, no man take it from me. But I lay it down of myself. It's important to know that nobody took his life. Nobody, nobody took his life. Uh, but Jesus laid down his life. And then he says, if I lay it down, I've got the power to pick it back up again. And he said, this commandment have I received of my father. Nobody had the power to take his life. But he laid down his life of himself. And then he says, if he has the power to lay it down, he has the power to take it again. If they could have killed Jesus, they could have prevented him from getting up. But he laid down his life, and he said, if I lay it down of myself, I have the power to pick it back up. Now, even though Jesus gave it up, uh, his own life, without, uh, uh, with, with, with some reservation and some hesitation, we see Jesus' struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane as he is toiling over the bitter cup. The Bible says that he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. He told his disciples that his soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death. 
Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what he was getting ready to face. And the human side of Jesus struggled. He fell on his face. And praying to his father, I want to take you back to the garden. He's laying on his face, saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But Jesus says this, and this is an important word you can't miss. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Let me put a pen right here and tell you this, that just because you do the will of God doesn't mean you won't have struggle. Well, as long as I do this, as long as I do this for the Lord, I'm mean, everything's going to be wonderful. I'm just going to have a flowery bed to be. Life's going to be beautiful. We're going to be on green pastures and just, you know, flying through life and la, 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 la. No, my brothers and sisters, uh, guess what? When you really sign up to do God's will, what you are really doing is signing up to struggle. I know that y'all don't want to hear that, but that's the reality, that, 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 that there may be a struggle with doing God's will. In fact, the greater the assignment, the greater the struggle. Sometimes you will struggle to do God's will. You know what you must do, but in the end, you must follow his will. Jesus even asked if the cup may not pass away from him, but he comes to the conclusion, I don't want my will to be done, but nevertheless, I want God's will to be done in my life. When you get to this point, brothers and sisters, you understand that it won't be easy, but his will must be done and his will is more important than anything else somebody pinned a song the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God don't know about you this morning but I want to be in his will I want to be in his will as we further examine the death of Jesus let's take a deeper look into what he endured for us Tell somebody he did it just for me. Jesus was arrested by the temple guards of the Sanhedrin in the Garden of Gethsemane. Shortly after the Last Supper and immediately after the kiss of Judas. Which was the act of betrayal since Judas made a deal with the chief priest to arrest Jesus. Sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. John records that they first brought Jesus to Annas who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas was one of those who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Jesus appeared before the Sanhedrin, Pontius Pilate, Herod, and then he was sent back to Pilate. Although Pilate admitted that he would find Jesus innocent, he still presented him to the crowd to suggest how Jesus should be punished. The crowd said, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas, and crucify him. Now, this is important because last week they were praising Jesus. They were taking their coats off, laying it on the ground for Jesus to ride in. And the next week, these same folks were saying, crucify him. That's why you can't put your trust in these Negroes for nothing. Because they will let you down every single time. That's why the Bible says put no confidence in man. You can't put your confidence in man because the ones that are praising you one day are the ones stabbing you in your back the next. Here's another piece. Don't get excited over men's praise. Oh, you sang so well today. Oh, my God. Look like the heavens opened up when you opened up your mouth. My God. Did it, girl? Did it? Did it? Me? You talking about me? And you start believing what people are saying. But let me tell you this, uh, that uh, when you look in the mirror, you don't need to see what people see. You need to see what Jesus sees. 
Here they are saying, crucify him. Kill him. Take him out. Get rid of him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a thief and a murderer. But they would rather have a thief and a murderer than Jesus Christ. That's what folks are saying now. Let me be a murderer. Let me, let me do what I want to do. Let me turn up. Let me do this. Cause, cause, and I don't want him. I'm rejecting him. I, I, I don't want him. I would rather enjoy the pleasures of sin than to give Jesus my life. Than to surrender my all to him and say, give me Jesus. Uh, oh, but is there anybody in here that said, Lord, I, I want you. Give me Jesus. Uh, give me Jesus. They put a purple robe on him, crown him with a crown of thorns. And uh, the crown of thorns was really a mocking of Jesus because they say he's a king. You said about you king of the Jews, you, you king. Uh, kings wear crowns. But we're not going to put on you a regular crown. We're going to put a crown of thorns on your head. But these thorns did not just sit on top of Jesus' head. But the thorns dug into his skull as he wore the crown of thorns. And they, that, that was bad. But then they sped on him. Now, I'm just going to tell you. Y'all can talk about me. I can hear you. Please don't spit on me. I, I don't even understand how those civil rights folks back in the... Because you spit on me, we gone. I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all may see another side, I'm telling you. But the Bible said they spit on him, and he didn't say a mumbling word. He was silent as they mocked him. He was silent as they sped on him. He was silent as they put him a crown of thorns on his head. Oh, but brothers and sisters, he didn't do all of this for you and me. Now, we must understand the death of the crucifixion. Death of the crucifixion was one of the most gory, agonizing, and shameful deaths anyone could go through. The goriness of the crucifixion actually happened before Jesus got to the cross. It started when the guards brutally beat him with a short whip with sharp objects interwoven into the thongs. And so as they beat him with the sharp objects, the objects would dig into his skin. It wasn't just, you know, somebody, your mama take his belt, you know, your belt, go get me a switch off the tree. No, 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 that wasn't, that wasn't it. There were this on the whip, there were sharp objects that dug into the skin of Jesus, and then they would yank it out. Dig and yank. Dig, and can't you see them beating Jesus with the sharp objects going into his back, and they digging into his skin, and rips of his skin, and blood is rushing out of his skin because of the objects being thrown into his back. Oh, brothers and sisters, then they tied the accusation around his neck so that everyone could see and read what he had done. In addition to that, if that wasn't bad enough, now can you see Jesus as he is being beaten with all of that and no doubt he becomes weak because after you lose so much blood, you become weak. So then on top of that, they make you carry your own cross. Now, this wasn't, you know, just one of those little... Okay, let me see my cord. On, the, on my cord, you see these elders, we wear uh, these cords uh, with the cross on the bottom of it. Now, what you will notice is that uh, Jesus is not on that cross. Because we serve a risen Savior. All right? So, so we, don't, we don't believe in showing you pictures of Jesus crucified. Because he didn't stay on the cross. But it wasn't this kind of little cross. The 
The reality of the situation is that the cross was estimated to weigh over 300 pounds. It's like carrying a couple of y'all on the back. So not only was Jesus beaten severely, not only was he weakened by the beating, not only was he weakened by the blood that had come out of his body, he is now having to carry a 300-pound cross down the streets on his way to Golgotha Hill. But thank God for a man named Simon. The Bible says uh, that they picked the man out of the crowd and said, uh, uh, can you help him carry his cross? Uh, oh, and that's why we sing the song, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone uh, and All the World Go Free? Uh, no, there is a cross uh, for you and for me. Jesus is bearing his cross. 300 pounds of the cross. Once they got to Golgotha, the hill, the place of the skull, the accusation then Jesus had around his neck was then nailed above him on the cross. They laid him on his back with his arms outstretched. They then drove nails that were made of heavy iron metal that was about seven to nine inches long into most likely his wrist. And they then took the same nails and drove them through his feet. Brothers and sisters, they did nail his feet individually. That you, if you've seen pictures of the crucifixion, Jesus' legs were not stretched out. But they put the feet together and then drove a seven to nine inch nail through both of his feet. I'm trying to get you to know that he did it for you. And then they lifted up the cross on which he was nailed. Let me stop right here and say that that was the biggest mistake they made. Because Jesus had already said in St. John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will. Oh, bless his name. They, they, they made a mistake. They should have left him on the ground. They, they should have left him on the ground, but they made the mistake. If I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Thank God they lifted him up. Woo, glory to God. Somebody ought to shout, thank God they lifted him up. Oh, bless his name. Thank God he didn't stay on the ground, but they lifted him up. And with his knees slightly flexed, Jesus was now crucified. As he slowly sagged down, he would have tried to support his weight with his muscles and his legs, but that position was impossible to maintain. Eventually, more and more weight was placed upon the nails. This method was so painful and agonizing Jesus hung there in pain until most likely his diaphragm went into a spasm and he literally suffocated to death. One of the soldiers came with a spear, pierced him in his side, and blood and water came from him. And all I came to tell you this morning is that he did it just for you. He endured the pain of the cross. He endured the shame of the cross. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He did it just for me. Jesus knew what he was going to endure. He knew all that he had to contend with before he gives them his last message. He says to them, if I can endure all of this, if I can take the nails in my hand, if I can take a crown of thorns on my head, if I can endure somebody spitting on me, if I can endure them mocking me and talking about 
about me how much more can you love one another if I endure all of this I can love you I can love you I can love you tell somebody I love you yes I do and it's because of what he did on the cross he says if you are my friends then you would do what I said and I begin to think about that why would I do what he said he says that seems like it's a one way street that if you have a friend what makes you friends is that you do things for one another you do things for one another but now Jesus said the only way you're going to be my friend is if you do what I command you to do Jesus imparted in my mind that if I did all of this if I commanded and dealt with the nails and dealt with the pain and dealt with the shame and dealt with the blood and dealt with the agony and dealt with all of this why wouldn't you serve a God that would suffer for you why wouldn't you serve a God that went through all of that for you why wouldn't you serve a God that endured all of that for you say yes Lord say yeah somebody who has done all of this somebody who went through all of this we should have no problem following him we should have no problem doing what he said when we disobey him we don't give him our lives we are saying to Jesus what you did on the cross did not matter but thank God he loved us when we didn't love ourselves he loved us even when we didn't love him for I heard Romans five tell us for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely a righteous man well one die yet peradventure for a good man would even dare to die but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us grab hands with somebody and tell them neighbor even when you didn't love him even when you didn't acknowledge him he died died for you why did he die for you it's because he loved us he loved us say yeah yeah he died for us more then being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from the wrath through him we are saved from the wrath because of what Jesus did on the cross for if we we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only but we also joy in God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by whom we are now receive the atonement but not as the offense so also is the free gift for salvation is a free gift you can't buy it at Macy's you can't go online and Google it but you've got to receive it for yourself for it is a free gift it won't cost you nothing to come to Jesus just as you are come to Jesus for this is the part I like for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners so by the obedience of one man shall many be made righteous moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abound 
grace did much more abound lift your hands and say Lord I thank you for grace Lord I thank you for your mercy for if it had not been for his grace if it had not been for his mercy I would have the right to stand right here but thank God that I've got grace thank God that I've got mercy grab hands with somebody and tell them neighbor you're here because of mercy you're here because of grace say yeah 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 Say yeah. Well, brothers and sisters, thank God for the death of Jesus. Thank God for the crucifixion. Thank God for Jesus going to the cross. But he did not just go to the cross for me. Because if he said stayed, stayed on the cross, I would still be lost. If he had stayed on the cross, I would still be on my way to hell. But when Jesus hung his head in the locks of his shoulder, the Bible says he gave up the ghost and he died. He didn't just stay. But he died for you and me. They hastened the body and put him in Joseph of Arathimaeus' new tomb. Joseph identically must have just bought the tomb. But Jesus was put in Joseph's, Joseph's new tomb. I wondered in my mind why would they put Jesus in a borrowed tomb? But all I know is that Jesus was only going to need it for the weekend. And once the weekend was over, he was going to say, Joseph, here is your tomb. But when he was in the grave, he went to hell and preached a revival. And Psalm 24 said, lift up your head, O ye gates, and be lifted up the everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your head. Say yeah. But he did not just stay in the grave. But early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave with all power in his hand. And he declared, I've got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And all power is in my hand. Yes, Lord. And Mary and Martha were on their way back to the tomb and they were wondering who shall roll away the stone who is going to get us in to get to the body the body of Jesus but when they got to the tomb the angel met them and said whom ye seeketh is not here but he is alive just like he said I came to preach to you that Jesus is alive Jesus is not in the grave Jesus is not on the cross but now he lives within me you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart and I'm so glad that one day I was a wretch 
Ratch on down. One fit to live and not ready to die. But I came to Jesus weary, worn and sad. Saying, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Dirty, messed up, messed up in my mind, messed up in my wheel, messed up in my soul. But thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood that was shed for you and me. Grab hands with somebody and say, neighbor, I'm grateful for the blood. I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, anybody grateful in the house? I'm grateful for the blood, ah, I'm grateful that he got up from the grave. Somebody clap your hands and praise the Lord. Come on and praise him in here. I serve a risen Savior. He's in this world today. No matter what men and women may say, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along this narrow way oh he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today you ask me how I know it so he lives within my heart hallelujah he lives he lives and because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know I know who holds my future. The life is worth the living just because somebody shall he live. I can face tomorrow because he lives. I can go through the storm because he lives. I can go through the pain because he lives. Ooh. So glad he lives. So glad he lives. Everyone standing to your feet. I can face it. I can go through it. You wondering how I'm going to be able to go through it. You got a bad report from the doctor. Got a big judgment case coming up. But you can face it because he lives. Because he lives. Songwriter said, all fear. Look at somebody and say, why are you scared and he lives? You scared and you fearful. 
God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I'm here because of the blood.